Uh, we are doing a full scale renovation of the museum, but the dioramas do fall into a category alongside our murals, like Age of Reptiles and Age of Mammals, of things that will not be renovated. Uh, so have no fear. The dioramas are, aren't going anywhere. Um, and uh, we will, they will be here uh, uh, when, you, uh, when you return into the museum uh, after the renovation. So um, I'm gonna take it over to uh, Michael now and uh, we'll head over there. Hey, Michael. Hey, Chris. Good to see everybody. Um, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. I love the dioramas, I always have. And uh, you just walked through the um, North American Mammal Hall of Dioramas here. And we're gonna look at the uh, bison dioramas, di diorama. And, um, you know, I, I'm assuming you guys are passionate about dioramas as I am, and uh, just take a look at this diorama. I mean, this is just the best. So we, we were able to get two of the best, best diorama painters in the country to come and paint dioramas. And this one is by Francis E. Jakeys. The other diorama painter is James Perry Wilson. And um, anyway, so if you just look at this. This is a, such a great thing. The, Bison in the foreground, the, the three-dimensional foreground merging into the painting in the background. The bison are just beautifully painted. Um, anyway, but what we uh, have here, we have um, we have three bison that were taxidermied. They were collected in 1888, 1889, and they were um, they were taxidermied by one of the very first. American taxidermists, and so they're they're historic. They're they're from wild herds, and they were put on display down in New York. These these started in New York in um, uh, on display in the 18, 8, 1890s and were on display all the way into the nineteen forties. And then the American Museum of Natural History took them off display, and we picked them up in nineteen forty five and brought them up to the Peabody Museum with the idea of making the, uh, this diorama. And the muskox is next door too, and you get the muskox from the American Museum. Anyway, they're historic mounts. The, the way these things were made though is also um, historic. <laughs> the way their skins were tanned are, um, you know, they, they don't do this anymore like the way they did in the 1880s. And so what happened with the skin is that the old, tanning methods, they create a skin that's, that's um, degrading over time. And so when I inherited these things in uh, 1988, they had big cracks right down the middle, down the, down the, the top midline, the bottom midline, back behind all the uh, legs. There were cracks that um, I actually worried about coming in one day and finding the pelts on the, on the foreground, on the laying down on the ground. So what happened is there was a, uh, a bunch of conservators at the American Museum in the, uh, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and they came up with a new method of repairing old historic tax and mounts. And this, these are the methods that I used. And so what we did, we um, used a, they came up with this uh, material. It's, this is a conservation material called spun bond polyester. And we glued one edge of this to the crack and let that set up and then glued the other half of the crack to the other half of the crack. We glued the spun bond polyester. So this spans the, the crack. And basically this is the repair. This is, this is what uh, keeps those skins from falling off. It's also brilliant because it, it moves. So as the, as the temperature changes, humidity changes, the, the hides that contract and expand and they move. And that's been what the problem has been. We've been always trying to like nail them to the mannequins and it, it just um, creates more problems, more cracks. This creates a, a, a bond and a, um, a repair that, that doesn't um, eventually crack away. And the, the materials are, are rated for at least a hundred years. So the, these bison should, should last another hundred years. Um, 
anyway, once we make the, once we do the, uh, get the cracks fixed, then I, um, and I, I worked with my uh, assistant, Colin Murray, too, on this. He, he helped me do this. But so the same material, spun bond polyester, and we use a felting technique, and we felt in fur into these, into these um, pieces of, of uh, spun bond polyester. And then those get glued into the, into the crack so that um, the crack disappears, right? And uh, there are little plugs of fur, I call them hair club for bison. And uh, we, we uh, fix up the, the cracks. And, and uh, once, those are, once those are done, I use a uh, airbrush and I sprayed a, um, a color fast dye onto the fur and um, that, that uh, brings back all the faded fur back to its uh, uh, original colors. So these things are really perked up. They really, they now match the background paintings. Um, they, they look like they're alive. They don't look like they're uh, cracking apart and they're dead. Um, the other thing that came up while I was working on this is that um, I had to remove the, the grass from the foreground. And this is the grass that was in there originally. And it's very dry and very brittle. And I thought, oh my God, I got to replace this uh, grass because it's, it's really falling apart. So I took it to Patrick Sweeney, our, um, our uh, collections manager in botany, but botanic, he's a bar, <laughs> botany collections manager. Sorry, that's easy to say. And um, anyway, I said, you better identify these so I can replace them with exactly the right things. He came back to me, he said, Michael, this two days later, he says, Michael, I got a surprise for you. He said, um, this grass is not from Wyoming. It's probably from Connecticut and it's probably from somebody's backyard. <laughs> so I was like, uh, I had one of those moments where I said the expletive and, um, you know, anyway. So I said, well, we got to put Wyoming grass in a Wyoming diorama. And there, it turns out that the uh, Yale Forestry School um, they, they go out every summer with students to Wyoming. And they, um, they said, I asked them if they would get the grass for me. And they said, this would be a perfect project for the students. So they dug up all this grass and they sent in like two or three boxes of, of Wyoming grass, fresh, smelled great. And um, anyway, I prepared that and made these little, um, again, little plugs of Wyoming grass. You can see them now in the foreground. Um, and these are colored and painted to look um, accurate to the, to the color of the, of the grass. And then place those in, in the diorama in the foreground. So now we have Wyoming grass and our bison are, um, are repaired. And um, this is what I've been doing with all these dioramas since uh, 2016. I've been working on it. each diorama doing this kind of repair work, recoloring of the mammal mounts, um, and there's just a variety of different um, restoration projects that I've been doing. So that's really, uh, that's really it. Hey, Michael, who, who do we have to, uh, to thank for, for the, uh, the job you're able to do repairing all of this? Oh, this is the Avon Grid company. Um, give them a plug. They, they gave us the money to do the renovation and to, um, and to put all the glass off. And, so thank you, Avon Grid. <laughs> uh, Stephanie, do we have any questions? Yes, we have one question okay. and one request. Okay. Uh, so the request is to try and show the dioramas as much as possible. And I'm sure that's not personal, Michael. <laughs> but they really want to see as much of the dioramas as we can. Got it. Sorry, everybody. We were, <laughs> we were having a little bit of trouble with our video, but I can, uh, I can definitely take that constructive criticism now. Yeah. And now we have an interesting question, which is from Lindsay. How do you keep the grass from rotting and falling apart? So that's a good question. Um, it's, it's actually um, dried in this position. I hung the, the grass upside down to dry in this, uh, in the, so the, it doesn't fall over. And it does dry. It, um, it is real grass, though. It's dried grass. Um, it is a little fragile. And as it gets older, it will become uh, more fragile. But it's also, um, it's, it's soaked in glycerin. 
So glycerin helps to keep it more flexible over time. And I don't think the original grasses were soaked in glycerin. They didn't seem very flexible. So hopefully these will have uh, some longevity that the other ones didn't have. Hey, Michael, can we, I'm just gonna let folks see exactly where your repair lines, you can almost not see them. No, it's hard to see them. There's a transverse one. You got it right there. You can kind of see that little crack going up. I don't know if I can, yeah, uh, right up, right up here. <laughs> and then it kind of cuts off that one. Yeah. But, um, you know, they're hard to see. And there's another one that goes right up the midline of the male bison. And you, it's, you can see a little bit of a dimple in there where the, yeah, that's that's it, but it's hard to see because we've um, you know we've we've felted fur right over it and it's all been painted and and uh, so they're in good shape. I'm uh, I'm really pleased with how these worked up. Um, and so should we go to Connecticut? I yeah, mean, let's let's follow you into uh, yeah. into the Connecticut dioramas. I mean, unfortunately, I can't talk about all these. I'd love to sit down. And I, you know, the next four hours I could go on. Maybe, maybe if you know, if uh, if we hear from folks who are on this that they'd love to hear about more of these, uh, we'd be happy to to schedule another talk with Michael. I'm sure. going to give everyone a glimpse of if you haven't been in the Peabody for a while and you've forgotten, this is the uh, North American dioramas. Yep of our musk oxen and yep. we started over here with the bighorn the bighorn sheep, sheep. Right. Um, but I'm going to follow Michael now into uh, the Connecticut dioramas. Yeah and I think I'm going to talk while we walk as well because um, the Connecticut Hall of Dioramas has also got some history that's important to um, hear about and it started with the idea of Sir, who was our director from 1938 to 1942 and Parr was a fisheries guy. He was a fish uh, biologist from Norway, but he was also kind of a Renaissance man in certain ways. He had ideas about a lot of things, and one of the things that he had ideas about were the diorama halls. And he was critical of the diorama halls that had been built down in New York. And these were the Southeast Indian Hall, the Asian Hall the um, African Hall and the, the North American Mammals, which was just beginning to be built in 1938. And the reason he was critical of these were that they did not include humans in, in their depictions of the habitat. They had no um, evidence of any kind of human impact at all. And he, was, he thought that was, in his words, irresponsible as an museum. He felt that we should be talking about how humans impact the environment, how they impact the landscape. It's a very contemporary idea. It's, it's still got a lot of legs right now with our issues of climate change. And he also, if you can turn around and just see this. So we were in the Connecticut Diorama Hall. And he also showed um, this anthropology exhibit on Native American tool making. And he felt like that was an important story to tell when showing Connecticut uh, dioramas. And you can see in this work in the foreground here, this is a shell midden, uh, evidence of Native Americans. And then we've got other evidence in the background of a uh, colonial farmhouse and a barn. Uh, there's the town of Stratford over in the distance. Sorry, you're going a little fast. That's a 19, early 1940s view of Stratford. Uh, this is Milford Point, and then the lighthouse out at the end. So these are ways that Albert Carr um, brought in evidence of humans and how they, they uh, impacted the environment, how they impact the environment. Um, and one of the things I'm going to talk about in this diorama, by the way, this is a painting by James Perry Wilson, a background painting by James Perry Wilson. It was finished in 1946. And it's probably one of the top five dioramas in the country. It, this is <laughs> just an amazing diorama. And it's, um, we got James Perry Wilson during World War II after he worked 10 years at the American Museum and he had honed his skills. He'd worked out a lot of bugs. And this is 
he teamed up with uh, Ralph Morrill, my mentor, who did the foreground, and they hit a home run with this with this diorama. This diorama is spectacular, and it has to do with the uh, kind of abilities and quality of the artwork and the, the fabrication processes that went on. Anyway, I want to show you these um, dandelions. So. <laughs> Just to give you some ideas of kind of the, the detailed work that went into this. There's a whole line of uh, dandelions that go up this, um, what actually is meant to be a, a path through, the, through this uh, beach, upland beach area. And it, it's probably made by fishermen, but the dandelions are things that grow in a disturbed habitat. And so that was, part of this story here, the human impact of this um, landscape. Anyway, so the, the, the dandelions are made, these are two of the ones that uh, were done for, for this diorama. You can see the um, inner core of leaves that's uh, paper and wax uh, colored. And then I made these, um, these larger leaves and these are made from fiberglass. So made from a mold and fiberglass. So that's how the, the um, leaves are made, but I wanted to focus on the uh, dandelion puff ball. And so these are, I'm gonna set this down so I can just kind of So this was made by Ralph Morrill. He went out and collected these puff balls when they were in peak uh, condition, cut them off at the stem, you know, they're hollow inside. He ran a, a hypodermic needle up into the, under, into that hollow stem, up into the little ball of seeds right in the middle of the puff ball and injected. This is all done upside down. So the glow, glue flows down. It's a um, thinned down glue flowed into that seed pod and glues all the seeds together. So that becomes stable. You can't blow these these little puff balls out, little puff, you know, uh, little puffs. You can't get them out of there because they're all glued together. And then that's glued onto a uh, brass tube. It's painted, and that's how those uh, puff balls are done. So this is one of the things that uh, I got to learn with my mentorship with Ralph Morrill. Peabody gave me a day a week when I first got here to work with Ralph Morrill. So every Friday I'd go up to his place and he'd teach me things like this. And uh, he lived uh, about 19, well, 1996 is when he died. So I had eight years of working with him in a kind of classic mentorship about how to, how to do this work. It was an amazing gift to me from the Peabody Museum and from Ralph. Uh, he's kind of a father figure. Um, do we have any uh, questions, Stephanie, from the audience? Yes. Or, or comments again, right. if, there, if, there are any, if there are any issues that we're um, not catching. Well, definitely comments saying they want to hear more, more diameters with Michael in the future. So okay. we'll, we'll work on that. Good. Um, and here's a first question. I'll combine something that Laura and Peggy are asking. Could you talk a little bit? Laura wants to know if the cases are insect tight and Peggy is wondering about controlling the environment and dusting the specimens. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how these are okay. controlled and preserved. Well, you can't see the holes that are up. <laughs> there, there are some in the North American mammal holes. So these are not bug food. And they actually do have living colonies of carpet beetles that cause havoc with things like insects. Like they eat the insects. Like I have uh, butterflies over in the uh, Forest Martin. I have to replace every two, three years. It's, it's ongoing. And it's impossible to get them out. We, we've tried all different types of insecticides and mothballs, and they're all carcinogenic, and they all don't, you know, we, we just can't do it. So I do have to go in and, re and replace certain things uh, because of these uh, carpet beetles. As a matter of fact, the osprey up above was, I had to make a new mount because there was an osprey before. Carpet beetles went up that that snag out the branch up to the top of the head of the osprey and ate the feathers one by one. And th at the time, these things were all done with arsenic. 
So they die, but then another one would come up and need a couple more feathers. And I went up to clean them at one point and the feathers literally sloughed off my head. So I had, I had to make a new osprey. Screech out the same way and the other uh, that way. They seem to like the light. Um, so yes, and there is periodic cleaning that has to be done. Um, but before this, I was in this in 19, early 1990s through 1996 with uh, Ray DeLucia. And we cleaned everything and um, went through it that time. They've just been done though, so that work does not have to happen for another 20 years. Having glass on the dioramas really helps with dust control. You don't have as much dust. Okay. Great, let's move to forest margin. Forest margin. So, um, so, yeah, why don't you come in, Chris? Um, this, this diorama has a spectacular canopy of um, sugar maple leaves in the fall. And this was done again, this, this diorama was finished in 1946, 47. So these, these leaves were done in the early 1940s. And I'll show you an example of the, the leaves that were done here. These are um, paper, paper leaves dipped in wax. They, the little midline um, tapered uh, wire is glued on before you dip it in wax, you dip it in wax and you spin the thing so all that wax comes off. And then all this other work is done by hand. This is done with a pen and a scribe. You can see the different kinds of lines. Very, very beautiful and translucent. You can see they're just like real leaves. These are beautiful. Problem is they're fragile and they, they gravity takes its toll over time. You can see on this leaf how much it's fallen down. And actually before I heated this and kind of pulled these uh, lateral edges up, it was hanging down quite severely. So I had to make, I had to figure out some way to replace those flower, uh, those leaves because it was, um, it looked tired. It looked like it was maybe a dead tree almost. So I came up with this method of, um, and this was a long process. Um, one of the guys that really helped me was a guy named Ken Lovell. He was at the DMCA and it was just the beginning of 3D work and he was starting to think about this and I was here with this problem. And he's the guy who suggested that we print photographs on fabric, right? And um, it was a brilliant idea. I rejected it at first. I thought, I thought it was an idiotic idea, but he was right. And um, so we had this, we found this paper backed fabric and um, you can actually run this through an Epson inkjet printer, like common printer and take a color photograph and print it on, on fabric. And once you do that, um, so the photographs are made of the leaves. The, these are molds that are made from the actual leaves. The photographs are linked to, the, to each mold. So I know that my photograph is gonna fit this mold. And the way it's done is I use five minute epoxy on both sides. I lay my photograph down into the, uh, into the print like that, into the mold. Make sure the uh, midlines match up. Once it's wetted with epoxy, you can see it pretty clearly. Put the two halves on, both with epoxy. You clamp it, see all the epoxy all over everything? Clamp it, and you get, this comes out in about 15 minutes. You can literally take a pair of scissors and cut very closely to the edge. But, and this is the final leaf. So it, what this is, it's a photographic print, color print embedded in epoxy. It has the three dimensionality of the leaf and the photograph embedded into it. And it's, it's kind of a prototype for what 3D printing and 3D um, scanning work is where we're heading for with that. Where you get those two things together, a photographic information, color, and, um, and the, more, you know, the form of the object, and you got the translucency. It, it looks just like a, a real leaf. 
So, and these are these are more robust than the than the uh, paper and wax. So, what you see on the lower edge here are my leaves. There's probably about a hundred of these epoxy photographic leaves, and I made branches with aluminum, and those serve to lift the old leaves up. So you you actually have uh, the canopy from the old leaves plus my leaves that you see. Uh, front and center uh, of the bottom. So that solved the problem of the, uh, the, or the, uh, the uh, canopy, the, the leaf canopy in the, in the forest margin. Did we have any questions on the forest margin? Sure. Well, okay. this question is a little more general, but I thought okay. it might be a good time to interject it. Okay. Um, and again, I'm kind of combining two questions, one from Jane and one from Anne, and wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the history of the dioramas and the people that worked on them. Like when were they built okay. and um, who were the painters and preparators who, who made them? Okay, so I think this might be a good time to plug my book because I wrote a book about um, all these dioramas and Chris is gonna send out a link to how to order the book, or you can actually go online on the Peabody website, and you can read the whole thing for free uh, with all the photographs. It's, I go into the a lot more in depth than most people want to hear about what happened with these dioramas, how they were conceived, how they were uh, built, who the players were, uh, and, you know, I, it's, uh, it's a it's a good thing to to do, but basically these were done with the team of James Perry Wilson as background painter, Ralph Morrill and Dave Parsons as the um, foreground preparators and taxidermists. I think Dave Parsons. So these these particular um, dioramas were started in 1944, and mostly were wrapped up by 1950. The bog went for another 10 years, just kind of, they, they, it took a long time to get the bog finished, just as James Perry Wilson was busy with other things and Ralph um, was doing other things. So anyway, but these things mostly happened, these three dioramas mostly happened from 1944 to 1950. And that was the trio were remarkable. I mean, these, these dioramas are some of the best in the world and they certainly match the quality of the ones down in New York, uh, some of the best ones in New York. So um, anyway, I just I just uh, encourage you to take a look at the website, and if you want the book, you can contact me, and I'll get you a copy of that. Um, anyway, and the other cool thing about this is we're going in here, and we're going to make uh, photogrammetry documents of each of these dioramas uh, in the next two months, we're gonna have the glass off. We're gonna go in and take 300 photographs at various points behind these things, around them, and it makes it into a, a three-dimensional object that we hope to make uh, available to the public. So you can actually kind of do a, a drone, drone's eye view of these dioramas from the back and the front and around. Uh, anyway, that's coming in. My uh, assistant, Colin Murray, is, is working uh, Curiously on how to how to get that to happen. So anyway, okay. So the bog is a, is the final piece here. Um, so this diorama, um, they're they're we collected. Uh, Ralph Moore collected the sphagnum. These are called leather leaf plants. Um, all the pitcher plants were collected by Ralph. The, the spruce tree. Um, Everything was collected by Ralph. And what happened over time is the color faded from the sphagnum. The leather leaves were brown. They looked dead. And, um, and the, the pitcher plants had, been, had never been painted, really. They were just kind of a maroon color. And everything looked tired in this, in this diorama. So um, Colin and I worked on this together. And I spray painted the... Um, the sphagnum to match the painting in the background. So your, your eye leaps from the three-dimensional foreground to the two-dimensional painting background. And then Colin, I, there's a good picture of Colin on a plank painting every single one of these leather leaf um, leaves by hand. And um, 
which really perked this thing up. Um, and then I was out um, hiking the Appalachian Trail and I came across a bog with pitcher plants and I said, oh my God, they are so vibrant. They're so full of color. I took photographs, we came back. It's the same time of year that we were depicting here. And um, we harvested every single one of those uh, maroon pitcher plants. And they're, they're the actual pitcher plants. Again, these are dried and um, there's nothing really except the dried pitcher plants and they're pretty robust, so they're, they're good. Um, Nicole Palfi More, her mother was visiting, Eunice came and she asked me if she could do something. And I said, well, why don't you paint the pitcher plants? And so we had, I don't know how many there are, there's, there's a, at least 50 to 70 pitcher plants. And so Eunice sat in my lab and painted every single one of these and they're gorgeous. They're, they're like much more alive, much more vibrant. And we put those uh, back in the diorama and they really perked perk the diorama up. So thank you, Eunice, that was awesome. Um, and finally, I'm gonna just go quickly, are we still good? Uh, time? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I wanna just go over one last process that has developed over my tenure here. But um, we, we have three warblers in the foreground, prominently displayed in the foreground. And one is a taxidermy mount, and two are models. And so um, I wanted to go over actual methods for taxidermy and actual methods for um, the uh, carved birds. Obviously, we don't have to kill a bird when we make bird carvings. And, um, and so with help from a lot of people, I've been developing a way to use carvings more often uh, in taxidermy. I mean, I still do taxidermy. I've learned taxidermy from uh, Ralph Hall. But, um, you know, I only use birds now that are cat kills, road kills, or window kills. So these are, these are two uh, black and white warblers. One is a taxidermy mount. The one on top is a taxidermy mount. You can see the feathers. And um, the one on the bottom is a uh, bird carving. So this shows how, how close you can get to an actual bird with, with, the, um, with the models. And the, so the, first of all, the, the taxidermy is a, is, a, is a real skin, obviously, from a real bird that was collected, like I said, by either a cat or by a window or a roadkill. And we make a, a body for this with um, like a hemp material, like a, a, yeah, it's called hemp, and, uh, or excelsior. We wrap that body and um, what's left of the bird is the legs with a wire, the wings with a wire, the skull and the beak, and the, the, the skin attaches to the beak and to the bottom of the legs, and it's, the skin has all the feathers, right? So um, this is what's inside a taxidermy mount, and this is one that I'm just showing in process. So there's the wrap body. Here are the wires holding the, the legs and the wings into the body securely. And there's another wire that goes from the head into this as well. Once it's all wired up, it's gonna lose its tail. We pull the skin over and it's sewed together, sewn together, and the, the uh, wings are arranged. So you get them out like that. Um, but everything in the body is removed, all the viscera, all the muscles, all the brains, the eyes, the you know, the tongue even is, is taken out of the, uh, out of the bird. So you just have the skin, the feathers, the bones, the skull, and the beak. And then glass eyes are put in and bolted. Um, the wires come through the legs that are attached to the, to the base. The um, bird carving, that's a separate um, kind of method. So this is, this is a bird carving that hasn't been painted. And it's, it's a block of wood that gets carved and they're wood burning tools with very fine tips that you can actually burn in all the detail. On this one, I actually use some wax to, to make a better curve on the back. 
and then I switched to wax completely. I, it's kind of too much trouble to make, make the, it's easier for me to do the additive and subtractive kind of sculpting than it is with the, um, with the, with the wood. Anyway, and that gets, that gets a beak that's cast, as I said before, glass eyes, and I put legs from actual taxidermy mounts into the base. So the, the, these are old taxidermy mounts, and they have wires coming through their legs, and that's what I use for the, the legs. And you get some very realistic um, models using this method. So those are the two things in here. And um, you, know, you can see a model when you, I mean, you can tell it's a model if you really look, but mostly they, they are pretty, um, they, they kind of blend in. And uh, so we're using them more and more. So that's really, that's really it. I've done what I've come here to do. So maybe we should just answer questions. Yeah, right? do we have any more, Stephanie? Yes, we do. We have oh, a good. number of questions. Oh, so good. maybe we'll do a few. Oh, good. Um, first, Theo has a couple of questions. And he would like to know, how do you keep the fish hanging and how do you get the tree to stand up okay. and not fall down? Love it. And maybe after you tell us about that, yeah. Natalie is wondering, what is the most difficult item you've ever worked on in these dioramas? And ah. is there anything that you'd like to be able to put in a diorama but oh. haven't figured out how? Woo! Okay, good questions. All right, so start with the fish. The fish is cast from an actual fish it's put in that position, and it's um, it's actually fiberglass. That's a fiberglass cast painted with glass eyes, and um, yeah, and so that's that's how that's done. It's made specifically to fit on that on that branch. the The limb goes all the way down into the foreground and is um, secured down below with with um, underneath the the foreground with two by fours and it's, I, it may be even nailed into the, into the concrete floor, I don't know. But, um, one other thing, this, this sugar maple uh, trunk, it's, when, when we get the photogrammetry um, models of this, when we get the photogrammetry Im images, I hope you can go behind this because you'll see it's hollow inside and it's made from chicken wire and plaster. And uh, there are molds of the, of the bark that are made on the outside in plaster. And then this one actually has pieces of the actual bark glued to the outside. So um, it's a combination. And this is common in, in dioramas where we use molds and casts. We use artificial means, uh, fabricate things, but then we put the real things on top of it. And it does this thing where you go, is that real? Is that? And it looks very realistic to me. Um, but anyway, that's just, done with uh, two by fours of chicken wire. And hopefully you'll see it when we get the photogrammic images. So the next question is how difficult things. What's the trickiest thing? Okay, so one of the things I've been working on um, are these insects that, that get eaten by the carpet people, right? So we have, a, we have a, uh, some anthills over here, right? And right in front. You can see the anthills down low here, right? And there's supposed to be ants in those. So, and they're only about maybe a centimeter. They're, they're very small. And so trying to make a model of an ant that small has been the hardest thing I've ever done. I've tried to do it. And I'm, I'm using insect paints and I'm using um, silver solder to, to make little tiny bodies. But so far, I've only been able to get to about two centimeters. So I can get an ant about that big. Fairly realistic, I can bend the, the, the wires. But that is one of the real challenges. And I just found out that there's somebody who does micro welding. And that's the answer. We do a very small micro weld of, of these wires bend them to look right, and they'll, they'll look just like an ant. They'll look just like, it. Um, and they'll never get eaten, which is uh, a huge thing. Um, 
I think, you know, we've, we've been doing some really interesting work with the 3D printing. Uh, back in the North American Mammal Hall, we printed some scorpions and they're little, they're little scorpions. Scan an actual scorpion and then getting them that small. And that's all technical stuff, but it's, it's been a real research and development thing. Uh, and Colin's been great with, with that. He's been working getting all, you know, talking to people, making contacts, and people love this stuff, you know, oh, a scorpion, we're gonna make a scorpion, and they help. And so um, those are some of the challenges. There's challenges all the time um, with, with the work that we do. And, I mean, the, you know, the, the leaves, I couldn't get that to work for a long time. That took a year of work, but failure after failure after failure. And finally, this idea came up with the prints on fabric. So it's just part of the process. Okay, I have another question for you. Okay. Paul wants to know, and so do I, okay. because this is something I'm very interested in about the dioramas. If you can discuss a little about the technique where you get the diorama foreground to blend into the painted background. Ooh. Well, that's, that's where, that separates the good dioramas from the bad dioramas. And, um, and James Perry Wilson was a pro. He was such a pro. He developed a, gridding system this is all in my book if you want to go into this you can read it there but he developed a gridding system to get perspective absolutely correct in these dioramas and so um, what that does is it opens up the corners in ways that other diorama dioramas couldn't be done and so you have tie-ins at the corners you have it in the foreground and another corner over there um, Mostly you have blocks like this. You have, you know, most dioramas have that in the corners because there's so much perspective problems. Anyway, the perspective is so accurate in these dioramas. But in such a situation like this, this is, this is the best tie-in I've ever seen anywhere in all the dioramas I've seen in all over the world. It's right here in the Shoreline diorama. It's great, that question was asked. And it was the foreground artist and the background artist working together and the way the foreground artist would do it, he would give James Perry Wilson some of those grasses right at the edge. He'd make a little bit of the mud and Wilson would paint to match those foreground props. And then they'd use them. And that's how that, that thing was done. But the, the painting is brilliant. Um, Wilson would actually give a little bit more of a highlight. He'd, he'd pump those uh, values a little bit higher right at the edge. And so it makes that leap into the, into the foreground. That is seamless. You can't see, there's actually a space of about three quarters of an inch between the foreground and the background. If you put the foreground right up against the background, it, it casts a shadow. And so there's a little drop right there. There's a three quarter inch margin between the three dimensions of the two dimensions. And you can't see it. It's completely seamless. So, that's why this is one of the top-notch dioramas in the country. Yep. Okay. You've touched a little bit on this before, Michael, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your research process. There are a couple of people who have commented on your expertise and wondered how you get it. Do you go out into the field to do research? What kinds of things do you do that help make this work so realistic? So. I have three answers to that. Okay, <laughs> go for it. Okay, so one was my mentorship with Ralph Morrow. I mean, he, he taught me so much. It was amazing. I mean, it was, you know, such a privilege to work with him and, and I learned so much. Um, the second thing is that I'm an outdoor person and I do a lot of hiking and I do, I'm out all the time. So that's, I'm constantly watching and I was, uh, my wife and I banded birds on Horse Island for six years. And so I know birds and I know um, processes. I also was trained as a medical illustrator. So I have science as a background. Um, that, that also helps. And the other thing is, um, again, back to this book, is I, as I researched these dioramas and I, and I went into depth, I read every letter that was ever written to James Perry Wilson from the archives in New York and here. And I, Collect, I try to collect photos because they tell you a lot of information about how things were done, how things were built. Um, so I have, I have a passion for all those things. 
And so that's all coming into play with, with the dynamics. Um, so. Do you have a, a sign off for all the folks, your, your fans out, out uh, in the world? Uh, 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 well, um, that <laughs> we, or, or should we just or should we just wait for the next tour? Next tour is good, um, but yeah, these are I could go on for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> Talk to my wife; she's like, "Would you shut up?" <laughs> so anyway, thank well, you for the thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to flip the camera around and uh, and relieve you of your duties. We really are grateful for the the uh, comprehensive tour. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. So uh, thank you all again for joining us. Um, it was our privilege to host you today. As I said it in the opening, we have two more of these. Um, we will be doing uh, the the Egypt Hall, uh, which is behind me. <laughs> Um, we uh, will be doing that next week with Professor John Darnell. Um, and then we will be heading to uh, the David Friend Hall, uh, gem, our, our most beautiful gem and mineral specimens. Um, that'll be uh, two weeks from now. So um, do follow us on social media if you aren't already. Please do uh, sign up for our email list by uh, going to our website, clicking on connect, um, and uh, you'll receive invitations that way as well. Um, if we didn't get to your question and you'd really love it answered, please feel free to reach out. You should have my email address. Um, I will pass them along to Michael and try to get them answered for you. Um, uh, I, I guess that sort of wraps things up, um, but uh, please keep in touch. We'll see you at the next one and uh, have a lovely day. Thanks, guys.